And when she came back, my dad came home from lunch one day, and my mom was rather unresponsive. The CO2 in her brain had built up to enough of a point where she wasn't really able to function. She had had dreams in New Mexico of suffocating. She told my dad. She didn't tell anybody else. And she wanted to be strong. And my mother knew she had this disease since Dustin was diagnosed. But since Dustin passed away, she never had a doctor again that had treated her specific rare disease, myotonic muscular dystrophy. And as much as we knew about my brother, and hospitals would pay for sleep studies, and we were surrounded by doctors that looked at him as a case study and wanted to be around him, my mother had a silent disease in a small town. And we kind of forgot what the disease could do to her. So instead of watching my son while I worked, she held him with a ventilator in her throat while he was six to eight weeks old and gave him love that way. It was a sudden downturn. And it was hard for her not to be able to care for Eli, for me. And I had a sense of loss again. I'd been going to Bible studies and women's Bible studies in church, and my faith was recovering from when I was 16. But I battled with it again. And I talked to the doctor about her myotonic muscular dystrophy, and medical records hadn't caught up with us. Um, They were in the National Archives when my dad retired, actually, her original diagnosis. Uh, But I talked to the doctor, and then soon I talked to him again, and he says something like, If she has myotonic dystrophy, I don't know that there's much we can do. And there was this chance that if we could fight the pneumonia off, maybe we could get mom back. She was fine two weeks ago. But there was this chance that her muscles had just hit the tipping point and that she wouldn't be able to recover. She had an incurable disease. And what is faith in the view of an incurable disease? Well, as a child, it was wishing wells. As a teenager, it was anger and resentment. And as an adult, my heart knew she couldn't get better. I couldn't will it. It wasn't about my mental power. It wasn't about my hopes. All my prayers were, thy will be done. And part of that was because I didn't know how to talk to God longer than that. I didn't know what to ask him after I'd asked him and not received before in the way I thought I should. It's not much of a conversation to say, thy will be done, and be done with your prayer. And Pastor Roy talked about prayer changing things and the question of what prayer changes. And his answer was that oftentimes prayer changes us. And when you just pray, thy will be done, and you have a 10-second prayer, it's a little hard for God to work with that sometimes. But my mother... My mother gave me strength. In this picture, you see my mother giving me a hug from her medical therapy chair. You see her summoning all her strength to comfort me. You see her going beyond what she was expected to do at that point in order to give her daughter something that her daughter needed. In the face of an incurable disease, did my mother say, I'm angry, I'm resentful? There may have been moments. But for her daughter, she said, I am strong. I am capable. And you'll see this next picture. My mother was able to teach me things about Eli. She was able to teach me things about being a mother. And as painful as those last minutes were, those last months, I am glad for the time that I had with my mother on a ventilator. I took time to appreciate her. I felt honored to comb her hair. And I felt blessed to spend that time with her and wash her hair. I don't think I'd ever done that before in my life. But because of what was brought before her, because of her strength in this, because of the ability and time we had with her, I learned to value my mother like I naturally did with my brother. We've all kind of taken our mom for granted at one point in our lives, right? God gave me the time to change that. My mother 
trusted her Savior. And Pastor Roy talked about listen and silent are just rearranging the letters apart. And perhaps my mother was given a gift in the end when her voice was taken. When you have a ventilator in your throat, you can't talk. My mother was silent. She could lip things. She could mouth things. But in that silence, we had an iPod that we played a lot of Christian music on in her room. And I imagine she prayed quite a bit. And her mother was strong, too, and came and sang her a hymn that we sang together, All Fly Away, among many other hymns. And my mom, when there was less sedative in her, was pretty good at communicating. And one morning, I'm in there with her in the morning before doses of medicine, and my mom's talking to me in the way we can communicate at that point. And she takes her hands like this, and she does this. And she mouths, she mouths fly away. And I'm like, what, Mom? You want me to leave? Do you need me to go? And she says, go home, go home. And she meant her. And I meant, Mom, do you mean you'll fly away? And she said, yes. And I want you to look at the lyrics in this song. My mother knew what she was saying. That she would fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. That hallelujah, by and by, she would fly away. That when the shadows of this life have gone, think about this in the context of a hospital with a ventilator. Like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then, I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. She was on life support. She was sustained by a machine, and she was in a hospital that she couldn't leave. And she could have turned angry. But she said to us, I want to go to my Savior. I know where I will be. I trust him. I love him. I want that grace. And she did that for me. And then she did that for my family. She did that for dad. And then when her mother and her sister came, again, she did all fly away. And she told us three different times. And we knew. We were ready. We were going through the paperwork to pull the ventilator. But she told each member in her family that she was going to God's celestial shores. And that is a beautiful gift to give your family. Beautiful gift. So we made the decision with her X signature on a piece of paper that we would let her go on to her Savior. And two nights before my mother passed away, Pastor Roy referenced this, but again I was sitting with my mother in the morning when she was most alert, and she told me she had good dreams. She told me she dreamed of Dustin. And then she did this, like Dustin was running and then jumping. And I understood that. And then she told me something else. She did this number, and she smiled with a very big, glorious smile. And I'm like, Mom, I don't know, understand what that means. And she had enough clarity of mind that this morning she could write. And I still have this piece of paper. She said, Dustin waters the garden. And two days before she went to her Savior, she was blessed with the dream of her son who came to tell her that I am watering the gardens in heaven, that it is okay, we will be reunited. Come with your faith and join me. And she went with that faith. God says his grace is made perfect in weakness. And in that, the faith I saw from my mother let me go on to survive and thrive in a family ravaged by genetic disease. My life wasn't over when my brother passed away. I was left for a reason. And my life wasn't over when my mother passed away. My mother had a beautiful dream of her son, and she went happily to her Savior. And the Bible does tell us that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And being born into a family with genetic disease, being born healthy into that family, I've wondered, what is my purpose? Why was I born with the gifts I was given? Well, the strongest woman I will ever know died of weakening muscles. And perhaps God's thoughts aren't our thoughts about strength. Perhaps God's ways aren't our ways about what grace really means. And God was in our story. God was in my mother. And my mother went to him peacefully. And my mother enabled our family to survive and thrive. This is a family picture taken just a few months ago. Hannah Grace, Hannah means full of grace is in the name in the Bible, and her middle name's Grace, because that grace has been a 
capstone of our life since then because my mother's strength, instead of letting me be angry and resentful for a second time, my mother's strength said grace is in this. So my daughter has two names that mean grace. But this, this is the outcome of my mother's strength. We are a happy family. My father lives with us. My mother's picture's on the wall. And we go on with those lessons to try to raise our children. And I do say our children because my father is actively involved in that with the lessons from my mother. God strengthens us in our time of trial. Mom couldn't talk. She was silent. She listened and she prayed. And here's what God promises us in Corinthians. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. She wasn't strengthened in muscles. She wasn't able to push out enough CO2 to breathe on her own. But she was strengthened in spirit. And that spirit strength passed on to a new generation. And with the lessons from my mother, hopefully I can give that faith and strength to my children one day. God's love tells us that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when we look at this verse in Romans 8, 38 through 39, we know that death doesn't separate us from the love of God. Neither do the angels or the rulers or things to come or things in the present. If we suffer adversity now, if we look at adversity in the future, a genetic disease in the family could have meant that another generation would have it. If things to come might harm us, even that will not separate us from the love we have in Christ Jesus. And my mother lived that in her last days. She was weakened. She was struck down. But she was not destroyed. And when we are afflicted, we are crushed, but we are still able to be there. Second Corinthians says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And my mother lived that in her last days. Her muscle strength was taken, but her faith grew in its place. And the Bible gives us those steps. It gives us those verses of strength. It gives us the chance to keep the faith. And even if God's ways aren't my ways and my thoughts are different than his and I would have chosen differently if I could say, can I have a healthy brother and a healthy mom, please? Every good and perfect gift is from the Father. And my brother was meant to be there and he was beautiful the way he was. And a life doesn't have to be long to be impactful and meaningful. And those were gifts that I am so glad to be given. Each day with my brother was a good and perfect gift. And eventually I came to realize that each day with my mother was a good and perfect gift. God did not forsake me. And even though I still have to deal with that anger and resentment that creeps up on me sometimes, God has been with me the whole time. His presence has been with me. His scriptures have been with me. And my mother's faith carried me through to be able to read these scriptures and think God's strength is made perfect in weakness. That it's okay for our bodies not to follow the typical pattern. And it's okay, and maybe even the way it's meant to be at times, or a blessing that can help us through things if we encounter troubles. And I wonder still what I'm meant for, but I'm finding more of it. This is a picture of yesterday. We went to a muscular dystrophy association muscle walk, and we met families like ours. And here, this is the director, the program director for the MDA. I might envy her job a little bit, uh, <laughs> but I'm holding the top fundraising participant goal, so thank you for helping me out. Some of you did a great job in getting there. But I want to tell you more about this story because this next picture, this is a woman named Kelly, and before yesterday I had not met her. And she had never been to a muscle walk either. And she came to me. And she told me she wanted my book. And she said, I don't have check and cash, so how can I pay you? And we ended up, she said, I want it now. I want it today. So she PayPal'd me. And she said to me, my mom's brother died of this disease. And we talked for a little while. And I ask, so is your mother affected? And she cries a little bit, purses her lips and nods her head. And I ask her, what type is in your family? And she tells me, I don't know. My mother doesn't talk about it. 
And it's hard. It can feel alone. It can feel isolating. You can feel resentment. And you, you don't want to let people know that your body's weakening for you. It can feel alone. But from my mother is a story that is a faith story, that is uplifting, that is inspiring in the end. And it gives the story of a rare disease in a human way that emphasizes what happens in the family. And this is a daughter from a mother like mine. And I have never hugged a daughter from a mother like mine before. But that moment, that moment was meaningful to me. And I've asked before, why was I born with the gifts I was? Why am I born capable, able to play basketball as my brother sat in the sands in a wheelchair? Why was I born able to write when my brother can't talk? And yesterday reaffirmed that a little bit. I was born to be the storyteller. I was born to find people like me in ways and share a story of true strength that my mother gave to me. About a month ago, I got an email from the program director from the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. And it was a personal invitation to come with my book and my story to their annual conference in Washington, D.C. And that's in September. I'm going to have to take a couple personal days, and I'm going to have to fly out there, and I probably won't make money selling my book when we count in the plane ticket and all that. But if I could give you one sentence about my mission in my life, it would be this. That my mission is to minister to those in families affected by genetic or terminal diseases with the story of faith my mother lived out in her final days. And I am going to do my best to try to pursue that goal because I have found an answer to the question, why was I born this way? Why has my life occurred this way? And I feel the calling, and I want to give my best to it. And it's such an honor to be here before you and be able to share this. But I want to tell you, too, that I feel the Spirit working, and I want to follow that. And I called the pastor who did my youth group, and I told him about that. And he's like, well, Darcy, you can't really plan for that. You just figure out where the Lord's going with you, and you go. So we want to pray for me in the near future. I am looking for ways to live out the faith story that my mother gave me. Go to the next slide. And here's why that faith story is worth so much. Because there's not everybody that's going to face a terminal disease. But one of the most important things I learned with my mother was there were times where I had no grounds to judge her. That there were things I couldn't see. That there were things I didn't know. That there were grace and a spirit inside a weakening body that sometimes it was easy to say, Mom, why can't you keep working at Walmart? I need new basketball shoes. i got to fit in in high school. i got to be able to have some nice Nikes. Or, Mom, why can't you just get over Dustin's death? you got to go on with life. It's over. It happened. Come on. you still got me to take care of. And you know what? My mother did a beautiful job in taking care of me, but I didn't always do a beautiful job in being understanding and caring. And when my brother passed away and I took to judgment, of wondering why people would waste their lives pl chasing pleasure. I wasn't loving them. I was judging them. And perhaps one of the most important lessons for me, writing was my therapist for three years. <laughs> one of the most important messages for me is actually out of the book of James and in one of the last chapters of the book. But James 2, 12, 13 tells us, to speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment without mercy will be shown to the one who hasn't shown mercy. This is my favorite line in the Bible. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And when we think that mercy triumphs over judgment, we can judge that something is bad. We can judge that a genetic disease isn't fun, that a terminal disease is a curse. We can get mad. We can get angry. We can judge the gifts that God has given us. But mercy triumphs over judgment. And even when we judge Mercy will find us. Even when we're angry and resentful or questioning or seeking purpose, mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's the story I wanted to capture in From My Mother. And that's the story I want to use in my life to share with others. That whatever may come our way, whether we're crushed or perplexed, we are not abandoned. And the strongest thing to save us, the strongest thing with us, is that mercy, that grace that comes from our Lord and Savior. Because whatever else has happened or will happen in our life, if we are in Christ Jesus, mercy triumphs over justice.